Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome to the Street University. Welcome to tonight's session. I know this is the session everybody has been waiting for. We have gotten emails. We've gotten alerts from all over, literally all over. I had people in Nigeria. I had people in South Africa, in different parts of the world reaching out to us, you know, because the Street University is reaching 35 nations at the moment. And it's so exciting that everybody is very passionate about our continent. And that's what this is about. Of all, I mean, this is our newest kid on the block, the Reimagine Africa. And it's a platform where we seek to harvest ideas that we can use to take our continent forward. I've always heard about the potential of Africa since I've been a kid. But for how long do we stay at the point of potential? When are we going to actualize it and live in that potential? And that is what tonight is about. That is what Reimagine Africa is about. So I'd like to encourage you, begin to share this. Let people know we are live. Share, 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 tag, get everybody on board that we are live. All we are live. All our guests are here. And this is going to be a session like you have never imagined. We're live on Facebook. We're live on YouTube. We're live everywhere. So please begin to share and get people here. Begin to share. I see the people coming in. And let's know where you are broadcasting from. Let's know where you're coming in from. Let's have your name out there so we can recognize you. Reverend Susan Karanja, you are very welcome. Uh, you are, that's from Canada, isn't it? Uh, Mulili David, you are very, very welcome. Welcome here. Mulili, you are in Nairobi, aren't you? All right. Yes, keep coming in. Let's know who's here. Just register your presence here so that we can recognize you. Yes, Reverend Susan Karanja, very, very welcome from Canada. Who else is here? This is going to be, and I hope you come in with your notebooks because we are going to sit at the feet of the masters and we are going to learn today. You know, if we do not learn from the history of the past, then we are likely to re repeat the negative history of the past. So you're very, very welcome. Lorraine Kirigia, that is an American, as she calls herself. You are very, very welcome. Sam Odera from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. You're very welcome. Dorcas Acheng, you're welcome. Where are you broadcasting from, Dorcas? Where are you broadcasting from? Oh, we are happy to have you here. Happy to have you here. Modupe Olotu, where are you broadcasting from? You're very, very welcome. That sounds like uh, from Nigeria, is it? Or oh, where is it? Edna, you're very welcome. Ken Mambo, Edna, you're in Entebbe. I know that. You're very, very welcome. Ken, you're welcome. I welcome everybody here. Grab your pens, grab your iPads or whatever it is you're going to use to write because wisdom is going to flow. The Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. Dorcas from Nakuru, you're very welcome. Very welcome, Dr. Lenita Sumba. You're very, very welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is going to be an amazing. Oh, from Bomet County. Oh, my goodness. All right. Sorry. My bad. You know, that was an assumption on my part. So, from Bomet County, uh, you're very welcome. Yomi Shegmo from Bricksworth. You're very, very welcome. So, we have different nations represented here. And just keep coming, keep sharing, keep bringing everybody. All right, Enoch Rotich from Nairobi. You are welcome here today. Welcome for a powerful session where something is going to shift. Something is going to shift in our thinking and we are going to take our continent back. All right, uh, in 60 seconds, I'm going to uh, begin to invite our guests. So who else is coming on? Let me know you are here. I just want to recognize you. Isabella Minor. you are very, very welcome to this very um, auspicious uh, gathering. Very, very welcome. Okay, in 30 seconds, I will be uh, going on. Lawi Kiplimo from Nakuru. Lawi, you are welcome here today. 
Thank you for joining us at the Street University today. This is not an academic exercise. This is the Street University where we get to hear it raw and we get to influence the nations of the world. So I want to welcome you because we have so much to cover. I'm just going to go on and I will be intermittently welcoming people. So like I said, it's a platform where we come to harvest ideas we can use to take our continent forward. We don't want to keep hearing about Africa's potential. We want to live in Africa's potential. And you know, across the, pro the continent, our problems are the same. Poverty and unemployment in the midst of plenty. I think that summarizes a lot of the African problem. So we know the problem. So we are not here to magnify them. Neither are we here to shoot political arrows. That's why we different nations are represented. We are here to get to the roots of our problems and find solutions. Let's take the issue of elections in Africa. Why is it that when elections are approaching, the police is on high alert, the army, everybody, all the security forces are on high alert, hospitals are on high alert, ambulances are on high alert. Why? Because of an election. Yet there are countries where people vote and go to work. So what is the problem here? Why is it that we can have an election, election campaign or rally at 11 a.m. on a Monday morning and 90% of the people there are young Africans who are there because they have no work? And it doesn't seem to be a problem. All right. So to help us unravel some of these and many more tonight, we have a panel of leaders and brilliant minds, people who have had the privilege of being right at the center of it all. First, we have the 10th vice president of the Republic of Kenya, a man of humility, a man of peace, a man that, you know, <sighs> I remember, Your Excellency, when I sat with you and you just kept talking about peace. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome to the Street University for the first time, the Honorable Dr. Stephen Kalonzo Misioka. You're welcome, Your Excellency. Thank you very much, uh, Wale, and I'm happy to be part of the Street University today. <laughs> You're welcome, sir. My greetings right. to all the participants. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Now, next, I would like to welcome, he's been a member of parliament in Uganda, the former ICT minister for the Republic of Uganda, and guess what? A two-time Olympic medalist, the Honorable Agri Awori. Let's put our hands together, if you can put your hand together wherever you are, and let's welcome him. Uncle Agri, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me to this wonderful panel of wise people. <laughs> and you told me earlier on that you are the oldest Olympic I'm the, medalist. <laughs> I'm the oldest living Ugandan Olympian <laughs> at the age of 83. Okay. 83 years young. My goodness. All right. 1960 <laughs> Olympics and 1964 Olympics. Wow. 1960, 1964, Wally was not even born. His parents were not even married. <laughs> 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 All right. So you're very welcome, Honorable Agri Awori. And then, definitely, last but not the least, I would like, oh, people are excited. They are clapping for you, uh, Honorable Awori. They are clapping there on the platform at the oldest uh, living Ugandan Olympian at 83. That is major. Welcome, sir. Now, um, and then last but not the least, we have Mr. Soji Apampa. Soji Apampa is the founder the co-founder of the Integrity Organization in Nigeria. And he co-founded that with the current Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibajo. 
You're very welcome, Mr. Pampa. Thank you. It's my honor and privilege. Pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Great. So I think to kick us off today, I'm going to put the first question to His Excellency, the Honorable Dr. Stephen Kalonzo Musioka. And um, of course, I would like to also welcome the audience, which is made up, like I said, like you've heard of people from different parts. And a number of you sent in your questions, which we are going to, um, as time permits, we will address quite a number of these. And as you know, our culture at the Street University, um, our culture, we, I mean, those of you who have been here, you know the culture of the Street University. We keep it civil. All right. Let's be courteous. These are the guidelines for engagement. Let's be courteous. Let's refrain from any form of insensitive or abusive language. The fact that we do not agree does not mean we should attack. We can we cannot solve a problem with the problem we are trying to solve. Okay? So once again I welcome everyone here. Now, um Honorable Kalonzo Musioka, this is this has come in for you. You have been in government for quite a while. You have been in government as a member of parliament. You have been in government as foreign minister, as home affairs minister, and as vice president of the great Republic of Kenya. Now, you have seen a lot. You've seen a lot of things here. And my question is, the question that has come is, with the exposure and the experience that you have, please tell us tonight, is it wishful thinking to expect peaceful elections in Africa? Is it wishful thinking? And if not, what needs to be done? And what role do you think the executive arm of government, particularly which you have been a part of, can play in ensuring that we have peaceful elections in Africa. Your Excellency. Well, thank you so much, uh, my Brother Wale. And um, thank you for the opportunity to share with uh, my fellow panelists and indeed uh, African, fellow Africans on what I consider a very important subject, elections in Africa, um, and yet against the background of the fact that uh, all of us believe <clears throat> that um, the time for Africa is now. They used, of course, to talk about the Asian tigers, but I personally believe the time for the African elephant, we like the lion, is indeed now that um, in accordance with the, the formulation, Agenda 2063, I can't even wait. I think the time for Africa is indeed now. If we were to accept Wale that the world is looking to Africa as the next frontier. But even, of course, there are some limiting factors. And, and we are talking now at a time when the world is living through terrible problem of COVID-19 pandemic and now we hope and pray that uh, there will be massive vaccination that Africans are not going to die um, and mass already losing one African life to COVID is one too many and so we wish we I want to take this opportunity to wish all of us well but now because we cannot talk about elections when, when Africans and everybody else is dying because we recognize that this pandemic is a worldwide phenomenon um, and, and uh, it has come at a very, very difficult time. Unemployment in Africa, even as we think in terms of uh, the moment for Africa having arrived. So I think as you talk of Africa, Wale and fellow panelists and uh, our our, our friends who are everywhere in the 35 nations. Um, 
I've been privileged to be my country's vice president. In fact, um, not just a member of the executive, but also a member of the opposition. Currently, I'm actually in the opposition uh, for the last 10, uh, 10 years, 10 political years. In, in Kenya, we have elections after every five years. And indeed, we have been privileged since our independence from Britain in 1963. Uh, Kenya has known elections every five years, sometimes under one party dictatorship and in any event, whether under one party dictatorship or under plural de democracy, we have had those elections. But with every election, we recognize that um, um, uh, the, the high emotions that come to play. Now, you had me mention that I'm um, in opposition because in 2013 um, we ran, I was actually the running mate of my friend Raila Odinga, the former Prime Minister. In 2013 we ran and according to us we won and then we didn't win. The matter ended up in the Supreme Court. Um, and the Supreme Court gave his verdict, first of all, within a very tight time frame of 14 days where lawyers from every side have to come in and, and burn literally the midnight oil in order to get the pleadings filed, in order to allow the judges of the Supreme Court to adjudicate on, on the matter. And that was 2013. And uh, I told my friend Raila that although the verdict of the Supreme Court is uh, that we lost this election, we do not necessarily agree but you must abide by the outcome. First of all, Wale, I'm a stickler for independence of the judiciary. And I think Africa must seriously take into account the need to separate the, um, the three arms of government. The legislature, which of course has the primary responsibility of doing necessary legislation. The executive, which implements uh, those uh, aspects of legislation that are already in place and an independent judiciary should I, the, in, the judiciary while it should be strictly strictly independent and and this is where part of the problem is so i told my friend raila we may not agree but you must abide by the way as i speak to you i'm also senior counsel uh the equivalent of queen's council in the uk and therefore you can imagine why I feel so strongly about the independence of the judiciary. Uh, in 2017, another election cycle, we ran, we think we won, and or at least we thought we won. The matter ended up again in the Supreme Court. And this time the Supreme Court made a very historic decision. I think the first in Africa, where a sitting president had his election uh, overturned by uh, the Supreme Court. Um, and this was because uh, of the independence of the judiciary. And so um, when this happened, I think the world take no took note. Um, excuse me. Oh, I, I don't know. My friend here is trying to, to give me some notes. I'm just giving Wale this background before I answer your question. Because then that um, puts places on focus, um, yours truly, with regard to the experience we have had in Kenya and, of course, within the East African region. And so um, it is possible to answer that question. It is possible to hope to, hope to have peaceful elections. And indeed, all of us should work in that direction. I must remind us that uh, when we talk of Africa, we have the continental body the African Union. Indeed, at my time as foreign affairs in 1993, when I first of, when, when I first served as my country's minister for foreign affairs, we used to have the organization of African unity. And uh, following the constitutive act of the African Union, we changed that from African organization of African unity to the African Union uh, Commission. Now, I was excited at some stage to hear of NEPAD, which was a, a really inspirational instrument because African leaders then felt we need to position Africa. 
um, to be able to take its rightful place within the community of nations. And one of the key pillars um, of NEPAD uh, has been the African Peer Review Mechanism. Now, under STAMS, one of the main four, I think there are four pillars, but the main pillar is democracy and political governance. Now, this is where uh, Africa should really refocus its attention if we are going to um, enjoy peaceful elections. Because right now, it's a mix. It's a mix. If I was talking about, I'll just give you the example of Kenya. We are preparing for the next round of, of, of political contest uh, by August next year. It will be another election here in Kenya. And we know that in 2007, we had elections. And the, the result of those elections were that we had some of our leaders being brought before the International Court of, of, of the International Criminal Court to answer charges against humanity, the worst form of, of charges. Um, so we learned from 2007, and, and that is why we ended up at the time as Kenya um, because uh, we had to have uh, leaders in the region took serious note of what had happened and everybody said no we must surround Kenya with all manner of advice and, and I can tell you that uh, the bloodletting stopped but then we learned our lesson so in 2013 as I say we had elections peaceful but disputed in 2017 we had peaceful elections again disputed so going forward it is possible while to have peaceful elections. Now, the example of Kenya can be can be replicated not just within the East African region. I'm happy to see my big brother, Awori, who is a Kenyan uh, of Ugandan origin, and I'm quite sure you're different <laughs> because there are borders in East Africa which should never have been there. When the Berlin Conference took place in 1885, 86 and divided uh, the continent into spheres of influence. Kenyans ended up in Uganda when they should be Kenyans and, and vice versa. <laughs> now we are working for integration so that uh, Agri does not have to get a visa to come and visit his older brother in Nairobi, former president, former vice president, Moody Award. Um, so th this is Africa. And I'm sure in Uganda, he will, I'm, I'm happy really to see him. I know he has participated heavily in the elections in Uganda. And Ugandans, I think, have a lot to share with us. But I can tell you from the perspective of Kenya, yes, it is possible to have peaceful elections. In Tanzania, uh, and of course, our hearts go out to uh, our brothers and sisters in Tanzania because we lost our brother, President Mabufuli, uh, himself serving a second term. Tanzanians, unlike Kenyans, have had peaceful elections all through, thanks to the strong foundation by Malimo Julius Nyerere, uh, the icon of African politics, who taught Tanzanians to destabilize their country. Uh, and I know you're going to have to ask questions about tribalism. Uh, the tribal equation in Kenya, in, in East Africa, in Africa, uh, is a big issue. But Malimo Nyerere was able to overcome, and Tanzanians overcame, and because of it, they have, a, they have known nothing but peaceful elections. They may, of course, be disputed, as in the cases we all know, um, we, from the point of view of uh, CCM, uh, whether or not they win elections in Zanzibar or in mainland Tanzania, uh, those are issues that can be adjudicated upon. So to answer your question in a very long manner, it is possible, I believe, going forward, Africa should prepare to have peaceful elections. It doesn't pay to have elections and then you lose lives. It doesn't make sense whatsoever. And this is why I've been myself working for peace in the region. Uh, right now I'm talking to our friends in, 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 uh, in the newest African, if you like, the newest state in the world, the Republic of South Sudan. And I know they are, they are in the transition period I've just come back from Juba, where I met President Salva Kiir and his brother, Dr. Riyak Mashar, because they have to prepare for elections at the end of what they are calling the transitional period. Uh, and I'm quite sure that if we talk firmly as Africa and say no to violence during election, 
say no violence, say no to improperly using our youth to check mm -hmm. out mangas of machetes and things and balls and arrows and shoot fellow citizens as if they are animals. I think that culture must belong to history. And, and I can tell you, it's terrible. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I'm going to now uh, go to Honorable Awori. Now, um, Uganda just came out of a very globally publicized election and not for very good reasons. You know, and it's been argued that maybe the problem is our brand of democracy the brand of democracy we practice in Africa. Because after all, the British settled for a form of democracy that embraced the monarchy. Africans, I've heard people say, Africans understand kings, a king, you know? Is that what we should be thinking about? In essence, is the problem, um, Honorable Awori, is the problem with our brand of democracy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Number one, as you rightly observed, African system of governance is strange to what we call democracy. Even democracy as it is, let me be very blunt, Mr. Chairman, I'm not, I'm not going to be rude to anybody, but as you rightly observed, we have had elections in the last few weeks. We are just about to swear in the president who won the elections, but some people as a result of these elections are nowhere to be seen. Some people are still disputing the results of the election. It goes back to the indigenous problem of defining democracy or system of governance for a given society. One, Mr. Chairman, democracy, can you give me a definition of democracy in any African language? We don't have it. At least in Uganda, as I know, there is no word, indigenous word, for the word democracy. It could be a number of words defining, but nothing like that. The majority of the African societies were governed by authority, which most most cases was hereditary. Now, what has made elections very hard for us as an exercise in determining governance is this question of winner take it all. We don't want to share power and the spoils of power of elections. I'm being very blunt about it. What has made matters worse is the element of corruption. We know that people will use any method at their disposal to win a vote. We have seen people being given money in order to vote for so and so. And when they win, they want to make sure they recover their money as quickly as possible. This is very, very blunt. We have seen people who have mortgaged homes in order to get uh, money elections. And as soon as they win, they want to recover that money that they put in elections. This kind of approach to governance is what's making elections an abominable exercise in the country, in, 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 on the continent. As a matter of fact, a lot of us now beginning to wonder whether we should not go back to a hereditary system of governance where a chief we know he is a leader and the eldest son is the heir will eventually take over but that one is not being disputed obviously for good and bad reasons but coming back to the question of why is it that a majority of the elections exercises we have we always get blood spilled. Right now, as I speak, we have people in Uganda who are disputing the results of electing 
President Museveni and his uh, political uh, party dominating the parliament. It's a serious situation. We also have a new element now causing problems in the electoral systems in Africa. Number one, law and order. Can you have an election where people do not confront each other? You know, in sports, speaking as a sports person who has participated in both athletics and, uh, and football, if you are declared the, the winner, you accept it, you take the medal. If you have lost, you wait for the following year or the following term. Any politics, we don't want to do that. We provide systems of resolving conflicts in the event you have got a dispute, going to elect or to the judicial system. Still, some people dispute it. As uh, His Excellency Musioka has put it, Kenya was an exceptional case. Malawi is an exceptional case, where actually the president's victory was challenged by the judiciary and repeated it, and the elections were settled. Same with Malawi. Now, why don't we have the same all over the world, all over the continent? So I would say number one problem is the winner take it all. Number two, as you rightly equated, the politics and sports should be done in the same spirit. In the politics, we don't want to accept easily what's going on. Now, another point which has come in, which I tried to touch earlier on, is the element of law and order during elections. We want to enforce law and order to make sure elections are held peacefully. Now, we have the element of the police. Now, people have taken the police for granted as if they cannot maintain law and order. Some of our countries or governments have introduced now the army to assist the police to maintain law and order. That has also created problems. But going back to the earlier problem of, of winner take it all, can we have a multi-party system whereby the results will not be disputed if done in accordance with the provisions of the law. People accepting the results go back and work. These are some of the issues which are causing us a lot of headaches. Lastly, Mr. Chairman, I'm sure you, where you come from originally, there has been an element of the barrel of the gun. Should power come through the barrel of the gun? Should power come from the ballot box? The ballot box is the nearest thing to democracy. The barrel of the gun is the destroyer of the ballot box. An army man whose relative may have been thrown out of power will decide this election was unfair to his people. And he can collect a few other officers and they take over the government because the ballot paper is not as strong as the bullet. So Mr. Chairman, in brief, I'll come back later, but in brief, the basic problem is winner take it all and the element of majoritarianism in democracy. Should the majority always have their say? Sorry, Mr. Chairman. No, 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 no. Please finish your point, sir. Sorry, I thought you were finished. Yeah. Now, how should the majority accommodate the minority that have lost? So, election, Mr. Chairman, will have to look at it again and the definition of democracy has to be looked at it from the African perspective. Wow, thank you so much. That's uh, the Honorable Agri Awori. And you know, um, I'm going to come back to both uh, His Excellency and Honorable Awori because, and I want you to, th the question I'm coming back to you with is, 
and democracy versus development people are crying out for development they don't care what you call the structure of government that is right as long as development is happening so there is that cry you know so is democracy a western approach to governance i'm going to come back to both of you with that but to tie it all up mr apampa i watched a monologue this morning where um mr dele momodu in lagos talked very passionately about the tribal divide in Nigeria, um, that all positions are going to the north. And he raised a valid point. He used a word I'd not heard before, logic and logicality. <laughs> you know, And he said, all your service chiefs are from the north, yet the most insecure place in Nigeria is the north. You know, And other parts are being left behind. Now, is this not what sparks tribal politics and why people no longer care about competence and uh mr pamba is it's like there's this unspoken code that the fool from my tribe is better than the genius from your tribe now with this kind of behavior what is happening in nigeria and the president's attitude towards this can the tribal card because his excellency mentioned it earlier on can the tribal card ever stop being an issue in our politics mr pampa thank you we're getting to the crux of the matter um this the, the tribal issue it, it has an antecedents the the tribal issue we're seeing is a manifestation of a deeper problem number one in the case of nigeria who is a Nigerian? What is Nigeria as a state? Most people find it difficult to associate with that geographical boundary as where they're from. And it's very easy to define themselves instead by their, their most micro origins to say, I am from the Southwest, I am Yoruba specifically, or I am Igbo, or I am Ibibio. That is the kind of mentality because the thing called Nigeria, the notion itself is not shared. It's not shared by most citizens. So we already have a problem then because it's an artificial state. The second issue, uh, that I should talk about, not only is the state artificial, the state is corporatist. Now, what do I mean by that? The ideology of the state is not about, oh, let the markets and the private sector, let's leave it open to the markets to drive change in our society, whether for good or ill. That's not our ideology or to say we have an egalitarian society where we're, we're equalizing between the rich and the poor, um, between male and female, between old and young. No, we don't have any such ideology or that we believe in generational justice. So we will not uh, consume all our resources today because of generations yet unborn. So we will put our commonwealth in secure management and only take what we need for today, mindful that other generations also have to exist. We don't have that kind of governance. The kind of governance we've got in most of Africa is one, so the direction of state policy comes from the configuration of blocks that come together to wrest the power of the state. So it will have a faction of labor, a faction of civil society, a faction of business, a faction of politics. Now, when those factions come together and you look at who are their representatives, you can almost predict the direction of state policy. That's the second thing. The third thing is that when you have states that are emerging in that way 
and the direction of state policy comes from this configuration of power, power is then everything. So, um, and there are four sources of power that I'm talking about. State policy, they would like to control it to take it in their direction. Control of resources, also in their direction. The control of use of force and the control of ideology. Those four things they would try to strangulate and hold. So you find often the reason for emergence of a particular government, therefore, is to hold the cow of state steady while their own specific group then milks it for whatever they can get within the period. So all other groups are watching and saying, well, this doesn't work for us because we're not one of them. We're not from their camp. Therefore, we have to get one of our own into position. It just so happens that the easiest label that we associate with is the ethnic label or the tribal label. So people tend to then group in that area that if it's my man, my man is more likely to think about me. So the purpose of govern governance and getting into public office is not always development. For many, it is power. Retaining power of the state, power of the resources and everything for their own group, for the group that emerged winner through this contest. So except you do something about the notion of state, except you do something about access to funds in terms of campaign financing, you have to limit how much each group can actually spend or deploy. Otherwise, you can use the resources that you've gotten, regardless of how you got it, to then strengthen and shore up your position in terms of state policy, resources, use of force, use of ideology, and so on. And then you cling to that power. And this polarizes society. And the easiest label, as I said, is around the tribal um, uh, line. So if you look at the case of Kenya, you look even Uganda, and in other places, yes, the manifestation is a tribal manifestation, but underneath the whole thing is this winner takes all, as Honorable Awari has said, this zero sum game that if that tribe or that configuration gets control of state power, that's the end of development for us. And it's only for their area. So, except we do something to break these five things, we will continue to repeat the mistakes of the past. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Your Excellency, um, Honorable Kalonzo Musioka, would you like to respond to that and then also take on what I said about development versus, or democracy versus development? Thank you. It, it's so heartwarming to hear my two colleagues um, try to identify the root causes of, of, of problems uh, relating to African type of democracy. As we heard from Honorable Agri Awari, yes, indeed, perhaps a definition of what democracy is, uh, is a subject that perhaps needs to be gone into. Um, and you know, again, giving the example of my country, in 1965, Kenyans decided through some legislative uh, uh, approach to enact a session of paper, which famously, famously became known as session of paper number one of 1965, the title of which was um, uh, African Development uh, and its Application to um, African uh, uh, democracy and its application to development in Africa. Some of our best minds that time, the, the gentleman who later became president of Kenya, Mwaiki Baki, and the minister for economic planning that time, the late Tom Joseph Boyer, were the chief proponents at a time when Africa was torn between loyalty to the West or loyalty to the East 
uh, the time when Africa was the playing field for the superpowers during the Cold War era. And so out of all that, um, I think we have to redefine our approach to democracy, as Honorable Agri, a warrior, said. Um, and you know, again, our brother, um, our brother Sojia Pampa has come out very clearly on these issues, on, on, on economic power. The reason people fight each other, wrestle each other to the ground, never mind the cost of that wrestling, uh, if it is bloodletting, for example, which has been unfortunately the result. Uh, and then when things don't work out, you resort, you resort then to using the barrel of a gun. Uh, a great a warrior spot on. You say the nearest thing to democracy is not the bullet, but the ballot box. But how, how often, how practical is it within the African reality? How practical is it to have a democracy that works? where people accept the results. Because if they see justice, justice, if we detribalize African politics and, and allow a situation where you do not have a combination of economic power and political power, because then a famous um, a thinker, Milton Friedman, once said the combination of economic and political power in the same hands is a sure recipe for a tyranny. We have seen a lot of tyranny in Africa. Where people hold on to power. Have we not heard of uh, even countries that legislate to say there is, there must be a, a limit um, in the presidential term? In Kenya, for example, it is now becoming the norm that when the president serves two terms, he has to give way to the next uh, leader. And of course, our friends in Tanzania have uh, perfected that. Um, and we have, I think, within the region and the African region to begin to see whether we can have a norm. I think normative politics is what I, we, we would want to begin to advocate so that people can look to the future with a level of certainty that come elections, like we're, we're having elections next year, whatever the outcome, we will not have people killing each other in the streets. Um, of course, uh, if, if, if some of us, the skeptics, uh, want to say why it is not just Africa which is uh, suffering under the weight of misapplication of democracy. Haven't we heard recently um, what happened in the United States? Donald Trump loses and uh, you find um, um, uh, Americans of all the people marching on to Capitol Hill to, to demand, to say this election was stolen. And indeed, lives were lost. So it looks like it's a human problem. But I think it is possible because you see Americans move very, very fast and were able to say no. They find it, uh, they found that was a, a, a very unacceptable American tradition and they've all through the media. And again here, I want to um, urge that Africa accepts that one of the main uh, problems we have is intolerance, even to media. We must accept probity. African leaders have to really begin to relax through these difficult situations and allow media to be truly free because a free media, including social media, will be able to point out uh, excesses that happen around us. Um, and so, once we have formative uh, elections, formative uh, approach to politics, that um, the, the reasons, for instance, why we have uh, violence during elections, we can look at the triggers. And I can think of at least four triggers. Firstly, elections tend to be intensely contested. Along those two tribal lines, you say it is our turn to eat. Uh, the tribe saying this is the time. Uh, because others have been eating. Now, that is a terrible, terrible approach to politics. Therefore, intense campaign period. And, and then, of course, uh, during those campaign periods, you also have some of the leaders unable to control what they say. They allow uh, emotions to take the best of them, and then you, they use inflammatory statements. Some call it hate speech. 
in Kenya, we've even tried to legislate uh, against hate speech. Uh, and again, I think we have to, uh, really the way forward is to, to try to, to, to have a norm that there are certain limits, draw the line, draw the line in terms of political conduct during election time. And then um, have everybody socialized in that direction. Another trigger that I can think of is use of unnecessary force and intimidation, mainly by the police. The police. Has it not occurred to us that near election times, you see a lot of African governments importing more ammunition? Yeah, more ammunition. You wonder whether the country is going to war, but it is that they are importing rubber bullets. They have even um, heavy equipment that is able to pour a poisonous kind of substance on people who are presumed to be demonstrating. Because the assumption is somebody will not accept the, the results. And therefore, they need to bring them under control. And that is when excessive use of force, mainly by the police, uh, becomes evident. Therefore, if African governments begin to say, rather than misuse resources by importing rubber bullets, by uh, importing more in terms of even military wear to control your own population, you use that to address the problem of youth unemployment because it is a youth who normally get misused during political seasons. And the fourth issue I, I see is censorship of the media during the coverage of elections. We, we have to relax. Africa must relax. If we don't relax as we conduct whatever type of democracy we ascribe to, the result is violence and violence after every election. Therefore, uh, I feel, um, Mr. Chairman, that uh, this subject is so wide. It is possible. And I started by saying I have a lot of confidence in the future of Africa. You know, we have the Badge, the youth badge. Um, when the rest of the world, like in Europe, uh, populations in Europe are aging, and you find that uh, they even sometimes want to revise the retirement age to 70 or thereabouts. In Kenya, for instance, we have we are dealing with a very young population. Over 70 percent of Kenyans today are aged below 30 years. Now, what does that tell us? The youth badge, if we properly cater and make, make it possible for African youths to get job opportunities and not to be able to wait around and every afternoon you find the youth because they're jobless, um, they're hanging up about uh, shopping areas in the rural areas, and indeed some of them then begin to think negative and take the law into their hands and commit crimes and because of unemployment. The need to bring food on the table. I think that is a lot that needs to be done. If we cultivate this youth budge, where 70% of Africa is aged below 40, and we realize that we can uh, uh, motivate these young people by bringing in uh, actual development, and that's a major issue. I started uh, by talking about NEPAD, for example, uh, the new partnership for African development. It appears to me that those days when President Tabo Beki, President Obasanjo and others, when they thought of wanting to give a, a fresh impetus to African development through Nepal, that was the time when I think everybody was thinking correctly. These, these days you hardly ever hear of Nepal. You hardly hear of African Renaissance um, because individual countries are very busy trying to sort their internal problems. Um, the other point I want to say, Wale, and allow other friends to talk, is the need to embrace multilateralism. Um, I, when, when Brexit happened, um, I don't know how many of us will have realized that the world was, um, Europe, for example, is becoming no, more nationalistic. And that is why the British were able to think of Brexit and a very controversial matter and Brexit was uh, was carried through. Uh, in America, we would hear of uh, uh, make America great again, uh, America first, and, and therefore uh, the, the role of the United Nations organization, for example, was undermined. 
the role of regional uh, building blocks because in 1991, uh, Africa got together, I think, in Abuja, and, and under the Abuja Treaty, uh, Africans decided to have building blocks towards African unity. Because if we achieve political uh, understanding and, and continental uh, political um, appreciation and need that we are Africa, I think we'll have made a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous achievement. Unfortunately, um, even what were things like ECOWAS, um, SADC, East African Community, seen as the regional economic uh, uh, blocks that would then be used to build the African economy as one. Perhaps chance, when brother leader, the late Muammar Gaddafi, thought of even having a single army for Africa. Of course, was seen to be a visionary leader but very controversial and they are to be knocked off. So we, we think that uh, there's time for thinking and I thank you Wale for having the street university so that Africans can think and get, as you say, get our continent back. But before we get our continent back, individual countries must first of all also take control of their own destiny. Be able to deal with the problem of the youth and, and so that they are not misused during political uh, season to kill each other and, and, to, and to harm uh, the aspirations of a whole nation. I, I have spoken a lot, but I hope okay. I make no sense. Fantastic. You know, thank you so much. Um, Honorable Agri, I worry. I want to ask you this. This has come in. Um, who are the African leaders accountable to? Is the African Union strong enough? Or Because you see, when there is no accountability system, when there is no fear of anybody, then you behave anyhow. So who exactly? And when... African leaders are caught wanting and it has to go to the International Criminal Court. Isn't that an indictment against us as a people that we cannot solve our own problems? Honorable Awori. Number one, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to disagree with you on the element of ICC, International Criminal Court, where some of our leaders who may have failed in the governance of their countries are subjected to alien uh, judgment. I, for one, I don't see why any African leader should be referred to a European, European system of judicial, judicial system to determine why he did ABCD. So what, for once, blatantly, I'll simply say, ICC is irrelevant in Africa. And I agree with you, sir. I agree and with you, possible. and that's the point I'm making, that have we resorted to ICC because we have not built our own systems? Is that exactly. the punishment exactly. for not building our own? If need be, let's make our own ICC. But as it is now, for us to succumb to ICC, First and foremost, ICC is the sign of or, or, uh, the result of the Rome Treaty. Why should we subscribe to that kind of system? Look at America. Yeah. They, have, they have refused. Even yes. the other day. Yes, the US has nothing to do with the ICC. And they have committed all kinds of atrocities in Vietnam, in the Middle East. Yes. Has anybody ever referred them to an international judicial system? No. So coming back to African system, let us have a system within African AU where we can sort out our internal problems and minimize bloodshed. Thank but you. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, sir. there was one point I wanted to bring out, uh, uh, which uh, His Excellency Mushoka brought out, and you mentioned it. The role of development in democracy. You know, the problem has been, for instance, when you go for elections, 
You promise your constituency, your voters, that I'm going to bring a bridge, I bring water to everybody, schools and health services. This is what we call development. And if you don't do that, you will not get a vote. And these are the issues which have distorted our element, uh, our, our democratic system of governance. To Mr. Chairman, democracy can only survive and equitably so to everybody if we stick to issues rather than tribalism, corruption, and other devi divisive you know, factors. Thank you, sir. I want to go back to His Excellency. Um, you were foreign minister, um, and you talked about the OAU, which eventually became AU. Is the, and I have asked this earlier, is the African Union strong enough? Look, when Nelson Mandela died, I saw so many African leaders go for Mandela's funeral, and they were all saying, this is what made Mandela a great man. And I said, whoa, so they all know. So how come they know what made Mandela a great man, but they are not doing what made Mandela a great man in their own nations? Isn't it because there is no accountability? So His Excellency, Your Excellency, um, can you tell us, is the AU strong enough? What accountability structure is there for African leaders? Uh, thank you, Wale. Um, I think it's important to take stock of where we are. Um, the question that came in was, who are the African leaders accountable to? Uh, there is the assumption, Wale, that perhaps in Africa we are lacking a Mandela. Mandela went through a terrific, horrendous experience of under Pathy. 27 years of incarceration. And he came out forgiving his tormentors. That is what made Mandela great. And he came out with such authority. I met Mandela in uh, New Zealand, in Auckland. And uh, about that time, I don't know whether my brother Soji would agree or remember, there was a story of Ken Sarawewa. Mm -hmm. Do you know, because, because of the moral authority of President Mandela, who had just come onto the scene, Nigeria was expelled from the Commonwealth unanimously because it was under Sonny Abacha. He had uh, terribly mishandled uh, the story of Ken Sarawewa and, and the world came out. And I remember Mandela took such a strong position at the end of which uh, Nigeria was suspended, indeed expelled from the Commonwealth. We need that kind of authority in Africa. Because you had me while I talk about, about NEPAD, the new partnership for African development. And, and I, I even mentioned some of the African leaders who are the champions of it. I think that time, President Butuflik of Algeria, President Obasanjo, President uh, uh, Becky, and they, they, they took the bull by the horns and said, we must do something. And they even went a step further and looked at the African peer review mechanism. I want to invite, uh, if there are students of African development and, and political conduct watching us or listening to us, to Google this thing about APR, African APRM, African Peer Review Mechanism. Under its terms, African leaders had agreed to subject themselves to peer review, where President A will be subjected, voluntarily says, 
I want to be peer reviewed. And there was a team of leaders uh, who would serve a certain period. And, and you look at the, the, various, the various aspects of a country's nationhood, its conduct of democracy, how it is approaching socioeconomic development issues. And then a report will be made at the end of that. It was a way of holding African leaders to account. But as it worked, that is a question. I think a lot more needs to be done. I think African leaders need to look at each other in the face and say, you have failed your country and therefore you have failed Africa. Hold them straight to account. Uh, I know that um, Honorable Awori feels very strongly about... Uh, the International Criminal Court. Uh, and, and I want to tell him, we had a very serious debate in Kenya, where even one time Kenyan parliament uh, voted to withdraw Kenya's membership to the ICC, at the end of which nobody moved, moved ahead. Because again, if you, if, you, if you leave it hanging that African leaders are not subject to anybody other than themselves, then that becomes a breeding ground for terror and tyranny and misrule. I think it is time Africa stood up and said no to African leaders who do not conduct themselves in accordance with the lay down uh, uh, principles. I, again, I remember the Harare Declaration or now Africa. And indeed, at that time, of course, as countries of uh, the Commonwealth as well, how they would conduct elections, democratic elections. How, for instance, uh, we need to be able as African countries to invite our international observers, regional observers. I have uh, the privilege to observe elections in a number of African countries. Well, recently, I went to Mozambique and, and, and observed elections in Mozambique. I was supposed to have gone to Cote d'Ivoire, but because of COVID, we had to cancel that trip. Um, and I observed elections in the northern part of Nigeria. It is possible to have a uniform standards, to have uniform standards of application and taken together, we look at them as a bundle, a minimum standards for democratic conduct. So that even Africans who may not have known democracy as popularly seen in the West will say, yes, this is something we can live with. Um, otherwise, we have a long way to go. And I want to say, personally, I feel that African leaders meet one every so often in Addis Ababa, which is the headquarters of African Union Commission. They meet uh, in other places. For instance, I know that the problem right now in Ethiopia, the northern part of Ethiopia, there is a problem there. I would have seen, I would have liked to see African leaders telling Prime Minister Abe himself a Nobel Peace winner. They say it is inconsistent, Mr. Prime Minister for you to be a Nobel Peace winner, and at the same time your country is burning, what are the issues? And to talk loudly. But instead, we only have been President uh, Joe Biden sending Senator Coons there. Um, I think African leaders are very good at uh, soothing each other's emotions. I'm sorry to say this, but I think we lack a Mandela in Africa today. So are you that Mandela then? Oh, thank can you. you. Can, can you be? <laughs> I wish I could. I wish I could. Because, <laughs> I, well, you had me tell you I'm, I'm a member of the opposition. All right? I've been in opposition for the last 10, 10 years. And, and Kenyans have not even given us the mandate. Of course, we will be looking at this subject as Kenya. Yeah? I, I therefore think there must be a limit. You know, there's a normal thing within, uh, for instance, the community of nations, uh, which used to be referred to as non-aligned movement, or indeed the South-South Commission, which Malimo Nyerere believed in. Um, and I think the time has come. If we are going to move our continent forward, we are going to have to be a little bit more aggressive with each other. Where we see country A has breached the norms, the democratic norms and people in Africa should speak loudly. But the practice is they will send uh, two or three wise men to go and uh, talk nicely to this president. I think we need whoever, for example, is the chair of the African Union Commission. Right now, as I speak, 
I think it's President uh, Felix Shisekedi of the DRC. He should be given a certain amount of authority to be able to say, no, we think there's something happening which is not acceptable. So I think African leaders, again, I repeat, must learn to be a little rough with each other without necessarily aggressing on the principles of, of, of uh, non-interference, for example. Non-interference mm. in the affairs of countries. That is a norm that thou shalt not interfere in the internal affairs of, of any country. But I think we need to begin to say African countries need to sacrifice a little bit uh, into a common basket. A little bit of your own sovereignty puts it in basket A. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the essence of ICC. If we can have, as my, my brother Agri Awari say, an African equivalent of ICC, so that we don't get away with murder. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, Honorable Awari, a question here What should be done to make the younger generation, to make sure the younger generation are able to participate in politics without the need to rely on godfathers? What, why can't a Wale get like minds, go into Nigeria, set up a political party, and have some hope of making progress? But we know that's not the way it works in Africa. I need to be latched on to some big name. What needs to happen to change that? Honorable Awori. The biggest handicap experienced by the younger generation, no matter how lofty ideas they may have, is the question of resources. They don't have the resources to enunciate even their own ideas, good ideas, in their respective home countries. Live alone, going beyond the boundaries of their country. Number two, there's an element of the younger generation admiring European, American, and other foreign aspects of life and governance. You know, there's uh, a misleading aspect in, in, in our lives to think that book knowledge is more important than indigenous wisdom, mm. which creates which creates a problem between generations. Somebody with a PhD might think he's better educated in political science and governance than an old chief in the village at the age of 90 who knows how his, his country has been governed, balanced things out, and maintained peace and stability. So I would say resource constraints have really held the youth down, not enabled them to move forward. Two, the youth seem to be coping the wrong aspects of we the elders in terms of corruption. When I talk about resource constraint, people tend to think you must have a six, seven dollar account, figure account in the bank to move things. These are some of the things which are creating problems from the youth. So I would really call upon the youth to look at ideas and how to balance things out. And then this gap, this gap which is coming up now, the age gap, has to be contained as quickly as possible because I noticed it, it became a big factor in the last elections in Uganda, the youth versus the aged. I remember my personal experience, they had introduced a seat in the parliament for the elderly, people over 60, and it was really controversial. The youth, especially in the parliament, said, we have enough old people in the country. Why don't you step back and mind home and leave us to govern this country? 
There are too many old people in the leadership of the country. So this is something you have to watch carefully before we share power with the youth. And the youth, if I may put it jokingly, others have said, why don't you people move on, possibly die, and leave us a chance, give us a chance also to manage state affairs. <laughs> uh, Mr. Pampa, I would like you to also respond to um, that question. Um, Mr. Pampa, I'd like you to respond to that question on um, Godfatherism. What's your, what should we do to ensure that Wale stands a chance, you know, in Nigerian politics, if you are interested, you know? Yeah, I, I think that we should understand power. Number one, no one will share power with you. And if you have to get your legitimacy from somebody giving you some of their power, there's a price to pay. It's high time Wale understood how to leverage the vast numbers of young people in a place like Nigeria. How do you use social media? How do you use technology? And the mistake most people do is that elections are next year, then they say, I'm running, and start to prepare. And you are a new candidate, and then you start to prepare the day before, the, the, the year before. It doesn't work like that. Who knows you? What base do you have? And we had that debate at the last elections in Nigeria. Instead of all the young people coming together to create a formidable force, instead we had like 80-something different parties. So with, with all of those parties and none of them with enough of a base, then there were no challenge to the powers that be. So somehow, um, if a Wale is going to emerge, he has to appeal to the youth and he has to be able to raise and demonstrate what he can do well ahead of elections so this is like a four to six year plan it's not it's not a 12 month plan and that has to be executed properly in order but if you're going to go into existing parties and um try your luck there yes yes you can go to the powers that be but even there they don't listen to you until they see that you do have a base and if you have a base then you will be wooed by the different parties to see who, who will be able to bring you under their umbrella in order to be able to, um, to win the election. So whichever way you look at it, the untapped resource that is there is the sheer population of Africa that is eligible to vote. Why that didn't matter before is simply because people were able to easily rig elections. But now that we're going more electronic and it is getting harder and harder to fudge the numbers based on the, the technology that we have today, we're coming closer to a time when real democracy has a chance to, um, to emerge. So it depends on what people like yourself and possibly people like me can, can do with the vast numbers that we have in encouraging them to, to, to vote a certain way. Thank you. Uh, we're rounding up shortly, but a question has come in response to what His Excellency said earlier on, that um, where does national sovereignty come into the picture in this system of accountability? Dr. Misioka described uh, that, uh, that uh, His Excellency has described here. Are there not constitutional controls in place within these nations? If these leaders ignore that, why would they listen to peer review outcomes that are not legally binding? I think that's a very good question. Your Excellency. Wow. Indeed, that's a very, very important question. Um, 
I, and I think it goes into the realm of constitutional law and even a need to look at each country's constitution. In my own country, we are even at the moment having a big conversation <clears throat> about what you are calling the outcomes of the Building Bridges Initiative. It's of a product of a contested election, as you had me mention, in 2017 when uh, president after the after after the uh, supreme court ruling which uh, nullified the election of president uhuru um and then the country was at a crossroads he reached out to his friend and brother raila odinga and uh, did what is famously referred to as the handshake as a result of that handshake kenyans are discussing the possibility of reviewing our constitution. We have a fairly progressive constitution, which you refer to a constitution 2010. Now, constitution 2010, Wale, and I know you're very conversant with Kenya, um, does a number of things, very strong on the Bill of Rights, for example, the, and a lot of Kenyans are, are yet to appreciate, for example, that um, Every Kenyan is entitled to shelter, to decent shelter under the constitution. And that is recognized, this country recognizes that shelter is a basic human right. Very strong on, as I say, the Bill of Rights um, and, and it completely imports the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, UN Declaration, and, and domesticates uh, that document, that declaration under Kenyan law, therefore becomes part of the Kenyan domestic law. What that means in reality is that certain aspects, when it comes to the issue of human rights, for example, Kenya cannot plead sovereignty and say, no, 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 we want to do it, deal with it differently. We have already, through Constitution 2010, a sacrifice amount, an amount of our own uh, consideration of sovereignty into the common basket. And I think, therefore, there's need for a lot of African countries to review their constitutions and, uh, and, and then be able to, to make it possible for them to be accountable. So that if a Kenyan today uh, commits a crime, uh, domestic law will deal with that. But there are certain crimes, crimes against humanity are um, a cross-border kind of crimes. And one can then be held accountable. This is why, again, um, with great respect, because I know Africa uh, had a serious conversation about membership of the International Criminal Court without, in fact, also saying um, we do not agree with ICC but then where is the alternative? Because we, we shouldn't give the impression that Africans uh, can commit crimes against humanity and get away with it. So a certain amount of, 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 of consideration uh, to the need to sacrifice a bit of sovereignty into a common basket becomes an imperative. Therefore, this question is very important. Um, but right now, the tendency is for African countries and a lot of them to withdraw to their cocoons and say and plead sovereignty that it shall not interfere with the internal affairs of Kenya, that it shall not interfere with the internal affairs of Uganda and, and, and vice versa and, and so on and so forth. So I personally think that in order to move our continent forward, we need a leadership, a leadership within what is already in place, the African Union Commission and other regional economic blocks and others. We have, for example, in Arusha, the East African Court of Justice. Now, that, that's a very good example of countries of Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, and South Sudan saying, we submit ourselves to an external jurisdiction which binds us as a region. And, and that therefore becomes very important. That, that some of these basic inalienable rights under the Bill of Rights then become implementable. So that then that is why I can tell you with all our problems as Kenya, and we have a lot of them, I think it's a very open country. And I want to say,
fairly democratic because Kenya is open and nobody can take this country backwards. We used to have those days, detention without trial. We used to have uh, all kinds of things, anything short of we were spared. The only time we were spared uh, what was happening elsewhere in Africa, in West Africa, military coup after military coup. But we learned our lessons. And I think that I'm happy to, to say that Kenya has actually set the example. But you have still a long way, a long way to go so that the freedoms uh, can continue to be consolidated. Thank you so very much. I think this has been a very, very robust conversation. And um, I just like uh, Mr. Pampa, your parting shot. Well, from everything that has been said, there is hope. There is still hope for Africa and that our young people still have hope and that things are beginning to change. They should look at the system of governance in their countries. They should look at the share numbers that are in their favor and they should think very carefully before they use that power uh, in order to make sure that they, they make the change that they're looking for. Um, I, I think I'll leave it there. All right. Honorable Awori, your parting shot. I would say democracy in Africa should be defined in terms of indigenous values. We should eliminate certain aspects of democracy, which, if mishandled, can lead to oppression. I would say democracy should handle majoritarianism we not take it all very carefully. And issues should govern us rather than tribal consideration. Thank you. Your Excellency, parting shot. Well, yes, uh, we must keep hope alive as Africa. As I said, the time for Africa has come. What with all the interests you are seeing being shown in Africa? by the external um, actors, other continents, a lot of whom are trying to invest in Africa. But therefore, as we keep hope alive, we must be bold enough to confront the problems that face us. As my brother Wari is saying, the win that takes so idea is not applicable in Kenya. And so let us reform where we have to reform and be bold enough to say if we make mistakes as, as Africa, we should be able to accept and move on and be able to recognize that the youth are watching. And the youth in Africa today, as I say, uh, cannot be ignored. Thank you very much indeed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I don't know about you. I was writing notes. I think this is robust conversation. And um, very importantly, we intend to take this beyond conversation. We have people, rapporteurs, taking note of this and preparing documents that different parties need to get because I think um, we have come to a point, like uh, His Excellency said, I am a passionate African. I believe in an African, uh, a greatness of Africa. And um, I believe that we have what it takes but as we continue to rob minds like this and we bring, you know, we temper passion with experience, I think that will help us because we have a lot of passion, but there's the wisdom that comes with experience, which is what we have tried to do today. So the conversation has only just begun. We have a whole lot of things lined up for you at the street university. We have conversations on the judiciary. We have people from some Supreme courts in different nations that we have lined up that are going to come and discuss the role of the judiciary, you know, in taking Africa forward. We're going to look at the legislative arm of government. We're going to look at the role of civil society. We are going to look at the role of media 
we're going to look at the role of social media and you know particularly we have a case study that um i'll share with mr pampa on sars why did sars not achieve what it set out to achieve you know so we have all those things lined up for you i want to thank our guests today and i want to appeal to you please there are so many questions i've not been able to handle please if we call on you again please would you say yes you have a generation of your sons and daughters who just want to learn and you know learn all they can from you so once again thank you very much god bless you and um i think i want to end with a verse in the bible uh regards to what mr pampa said and this is my word to young people nobody will give you power you are waiting for permission stop waiting for permission there are areas you can do things without permission when we went to the slums of madari in kenya to start empowering people we didn't get permission we didn't need permission for that all right but remember the words of uh, concerning jesus in acts chapter 1 verse 1 he says concerning the things that jesus began both to do and to teach we have a lot of young people who want to speak but they have not done so let our power come from our doing and not just from our speaking till we meet again god bless you and keep winning thank you thank you